Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper. I'm the Vice President of Media and Editorial here at the club, and I also have the pleasure of co-hosting the Michelle Miao Show at the club. This is just the latest of more than 100 online programs we have presented ever since the pandemic hit and pretty much shut down live events. Uh, we are presenting these largely free. Uh, we certainly welcome you to, to not only enjoy this program, but to check out commonwealthclub.org slash online for a list of actually an ever growing list of upcoming programs we have scheduled. We have more than, I think, two or three dozen already on the schedule. Um, on today's program, we're going to talk about something that is about as timely as you can get, uh, some very big news. And so we are very glad we were able to present this program to you. I'm going to now introduce Michelle Miao, a uh, member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, as well as the host of The Michelle Miao Show. Hello again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for joining us here for this special program. And that's right, it is timely. We'll focus on the Supreme Court decisions and the impact of the LGBTQI community. Um, and we had some, some recent good news, as recent as this morning. And so I can't wait, so let's get started. I'm extremely proud and honored to be introducing our panelists here today. We have Felicia Medina, who's a queer Latina attorney and founding partner of Medina Orthwine LLP. Her practice focuses on individual and class action employment discrimination and harassment cases relating to race, gender, gender identity, and expression and sexual orientation, as well as wage and our collective actions. We have Kevin Love Hubbard, who's a partner at Medina Orthwine LLP. He has dedicated his career to civil rights and brings extensive experience in civil rights litigation to his firm, including individual and class employment discrimination and wage and hour claims, as well as constitutional claims involving police and prison misconduct. We have Imani Rupert Gordon, who is the executive director for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. NCLR is a national legal organization committed to advancing the civil and human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and their families through litigation, legislation, policy, and public education. And then finally, but, but definitely, last but not least, Reverend Elena Rose Vera, a Filipina Ashkenazi trans woman originally from rural Oregon who joined Trans Lifeline's executive team in May of 2018. A longtime organizer, educator, and performing artist, she holds an M, uh, I'm sorry, holds a master's of, I, I, don't, I don't know all of the, uh, the uh, uh, we'll have to ask uh, the Reverend it's not about right. her. <laughs> I got my BA and I stopped there. <laughs> Focus on social justice and community care work and was ordained as a minister by the church for the fellowship of all peoples. Welcome everyone to this special program. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, I think, you know, before we start talking about uh, all uh, getting into the cases, and I promise we're going to geek out and then we're going to celebrate a couple of these and then we'll, we'll also talk about, you know, next steps. Um, let's hear from all of you and as attorneys, as legal scholars, as movement builders, like what were you doing when the decision on LGBTQ employment rights um, was announced? Uh, and then how did you celebrate? Great. We'll start with Felicia. Um, rather oddly, I was still asleep. I'm usually an early riser, you know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., I'm ready to go. And I had, had um, we were fighting many battles on the litigation front and the policy front and, you know, kind of feeling really, really down and really needing some inspiration and a win or something to keep going. And I woke up to all the text messages and all my law school friends were, you know, downloading the analysis, you know, giving their analysis. I was shocked. It was a breath of fresh air. It was a brand new day. But simultaneously holding what is going on outside of the employment arena and that there needs to be justice in the streets and justice in corporate America and justice across all the states that did not have protections for LGBT folks on the books and holding all those emotions at the same time and getting to that decision and reading it and seeing Justice Gorsuch was the author. <laughs> I, I, he must have been channeling Donna Summer and a whole bunch of other, you know, LGBT pop, you know, music. And I, 
I was blown away. And I'm, you know, happy to be talking about this decision and the fight's not over. And that's where I was. I was astonishingly still asleep at nine or whatever in the morning. Kevin. Uh, I was uh, getting prepared for a, a mediation on behalf of a client in a, in a pregnancy discrimination suit. And uh, so I actually, it took longer for me to have the opportunity to read the decision than it usually would. But as I was uh, reflecting on, on the particular time that we're in as we're uh, getting this decision, I thought back to 2015 when Obergefell came down and and it was a similar situation that morning in June when, when we read that decision. I got to, you know, leave the house and walk to BART and somebody on the street was playing a, a song from Hairspray, You Can't Stop the Beat. And it felt like a it felt like a really public celebration. So it felt a little different this time around because I got to walk from my bedroom to this office here to do the mediation on Zoom. And, and so I'm really just thinking about looking forward to the time when I can get together with my community in person and, and have the opportunity to really celebrate this opinion the way that it deserves to be celebrated. Awesome. Imani. I mean, it was, it was a beautiful surprise. I think that uh, many of us were shocked. I remember on Friday, we'd heard um, kind of a uh, bad rule come out. And so, and I remember thinking like, you know, I think the, de the decision's going to come out on Monday, but you know, every Monday and Thursday, we're kind of waiting. I know that I'm texting with our legal director, like, do you think it's going to come out? And then on Monday, I was like, you know what? It's probably not going to come out. I was actually just like, I was putting it off. I was putting off like going out for a run. I was actually like, um, like lacing my shoes and, and looking at email at the same time. And then they started coming in with this decision. And I was like, wait a minute, this is because, you know, we didn't expect this necessarily. And, and at best, we were expecting some sort of ambiguous decision that we would have to, um, we'd have to read closely and figure out like, what is this saying? What does this actually translate to? And so now all these emails are coming in, but none of us can download that. Like, so, <laughs> so we're trying to like get to it. We're like, what does this mean? Like, we're saying yes. Like, what is, what is this? And it seemed like forever. And then finally someone got the PDF, sent it out. Um, and I mean, just, I, so, just so incredibly shocked. Not I mean, the thing is, it's, it's the right thing, and this is what the Supreme Court's supposed to be doing. It's just we are obviously shocked by by the the judges that that did it and um, and uh, believed in this. So it was just it was beautiful. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. Took my running shoes right off, and and we got to start a, a wonderful day, which is you know in a time like this is incredibly important. You know, we're actually seeing um, structural change happen, and um, and it's it's just beautiful. It was really really nice. Elena. I, I have never been so happy to be wrong. I, you know, I, I've been following this case for a long time. And, you know, I remember reading the arguments in front of the court and even the progressive judges who were good on the orientation questions were, were not speaking in an informed or empathetic way about trans people. You know, they were, they were not referring to trans people by their actual genders or their pronouns. They kept trying to drag it to a question of public accommodations when that wasn't the, the shape of the case. They were disrespectful to, you know, the trans lawyer who was right in front of them arguing the case. And I, w I was, I also was not optimistic. I thought we might at best get a decent result on the questions of orientation. Um, but I was, I was very strongly expecting uh, a terrible ruling on the question of trans employment rights. And I remember having many meetings with our staff at Trans Lifeline about it. Trans Lifeline is the largest direct services provider to trans people in North America. And our peer support line gets people calling all the time about discrimination at work and in employment. And they talk about how it affects their access to medical care and how that affects their access to housing and how it affects their basic safety and well-being. And since COVID hit, we've seen four to five times the number of calls about uh, trouble in the workplace, discrimination in hiring and at work, um, people losing jobs and how it's affecting them. And we were just braced for it to really, really hurt people. And so I've been getting up, I'm not a morning person, and I've been getting up you know, at dawn every Monday and Thursday and waiting for, for Supreme Court opinions. And when it came out, um, I, I cannot describe the, the shock and relief I, <laughs> uh, at, at knowing how many people would have been harmed by a bad decision who, who got a reprieve instead. And you know, I admit one of my first reactions was, well, I, I need to go rewrite some press releases. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, but I, you know, that's a real that's a really good challenge to have in your work day. It was, uh, yeah, it was a beautiful surprise. Well, now when I what I've read about this decision was that it was it was a pretty clear decision and and, and <laughs> a very strong. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Many of you are. What what does that actually mean? I mean, what what does this buttress in, in existing laws or are there new laws that will in some states will need to be written or is this a, a federal thing? Let's get into actually what what will change or what what this addressed. Um, OK, so the decision that was shocking to all of us, especially coming out of the oral arguments and echoing the sentiments of Elena in terms of the dehumanizing nature of the briefing and the justices questioning. Um, what the decision says is that sex is intertwined with sexual orientation and whether you are transgender and that if an employer uh, makes a decision, an adverse employment decision based on sex with this definition of sex, which was stipulated to you by both sides of the, uh, of the aisle, meaning biological sex, um, because that supposedly was the understanding of what sex meant when the law was passed in 1964. And Judge Gorsuch, even though there had been lots of case law on the books for a while, actually protecting transgender employees in the workplace for many, many years because that was seen by the justices and the judges who had heard those cases in their binary view of sex and gender, um, that, that if someone is transitioning in the workplace and you terminate them, that that is because of sex. And that's the legal standard by which you have to prove liability and causation. And what this, and Justice Gorsuch said that this is just a simple textualist argument. Just look at the text of Title VII, which was passed in 1964, and you don't need to get into all these other things about the differences. He was trying to collapse like gender and sex together um, and just look at the statute, and there's no need to write in any other specific protected classifications into Title VII because it's already there. And from, uh, you know, an enforcement standpoint and a, a legislative standpoint, only 28 states, um, they don't have anything on their books in terms of state law protecting people based on their sexual orientation or gender identity at the state level. So employers are free based on the older view of what Title VII meant um, that hadn't been decided by the U.S. Supreme Court that you could terminate people based on their gender identity and sexual orientation. So that means now there are federal protections that private attorney generals and, and lawyers can go and enforce on, file lawsuits to get protections for people and collect damages for the very real harm that discrimination in employment causes. Anyone else want to add to that? No, I'll, I'll add to it because it is worth mentioning that though this is about employment discrimination, that it's also going to have huge implications um, for how we're uh, considering other discrimination laws. And that's going to be really exciting, like how we interpret rules like the heinous when we found out um, last uh, Friday when, we, when uh, the administration was attempting to keep trans folks from accessing health care, or when we're considering, like to Felicia's point, when we're considering what it looks like for folks that come from states that don't have um, employment protections. And so, and that's huge. You know, 28 states, and I think that, that there's um, a misconception that sometimes we think that um, we live in a place that is a bit safer than we are. But before this, there were absolutely no federal protections for LGBTQ people. So this is going to have an, an impact on employment specifically, but also it's going to have an impact on how we interpret everything else. And that's huge because um, when we're looking at federal protections, those are going to carry more weight. You know, like at um, NTLR, we've been involved in a case where we very specifically um, were granted a stay while we are while well, waiting the decision of the Supreme Court. So we've lost cases because there haven't been, because people have interpreted, um, uh, because the way that people have interpreted uh, Title VII to not include LGBTQ people. So we fully expect to be winning cases for that same reason. And that's going to be huge for employment, but for other arenas as well. Mm. I want to go back to Reverend Elena. You had mentioned we've been 
waiting for a long time, you know, for this. And I will say, uh, I think throughout my entire 10 plus years of uh, interviewing LGBTQ advocates and activists, there we've always known, we've always uh, re- recognized and realized that, yes, you can still be fired for being gay, even when federal marriage equality, you know, the decision came down. Um, but, uh, you, you, two things. you When talking about how long we've waited for this, just how long, you know, how long we've been fighting for, for this. And then secondly, how, the importance of this case and that it was a transgender woman you know, uh, I believe, or, or, or many, and you can tell us because we don't know the specifics of the actual complaint, but or what led to this, this case now that's been heard for LGBTQ people. Um, I'll tell you one thing. I mean, even talking about trying to include an all-inclusive bill, a federal bill to protect LGBTQ in employment, uh, I do remember that the transgender community had been left out of certain efforts just because people had felt like we couldn't get it passed. And now here we are, uh, a Supreme Court, de- I just got chills, a Supreme Court decision and uh, with transgender people uh, and cases and lives um, who, who have who've led the way in, in, in a lot of ways. And I'm really emotional today, but Reverend, let's hear from you. <laughs> No, it's it's true. I think you're you're very right to point out that there is a long history of trans people being treated as expendable in in the sort of civil rights work of our general LGBTQI community, um, and uh, that's really been exacerbated in recent years by a lot of um, very organized right wing propaganda campaigns. Um, if you look at the last few days of meetings of uh, not the last few days, the last few years of groups like the Values Voter Summit, the Heritage Foundation, the Family Research Council, all of these organizations that are sort of the organized patriarchy lobby um, and who have been explicitly anti-LGB, who have been explicitly anti-marriage equality and so on, that they very openly talked about having a strategy where they had done research um, and they had observed this long-standing history of trans people being sort of thrown under the bus by the rest of the movement or being seen as expendable by the rest of the movement. And they wrote explicitly that the, that the strategy for challenging all of our rights, for fighting back on non-discrimination protections for all orientations, for, for LGBTQ people of all kinds, um, for fighting back against the rights of women in the workplace, for fighting back against our protections around gender expression in the workplace, like that you can't force women at your workplace to wear makeup and skirts, that kind of thing, that the that the tip of the wedge that they could use to attack all of that was to attack trans people. Um, and they were very organized about it. They, they wrote out a document with, we're going to come after um, the notion of trans people in sports. We're going to come after trans people in employment. We're going to, you know, do, you know, they, they laid out all of these cultural areas that they could be putting out stories. Um, they were very explicit about generating the bathroom predator myth um, that, you know, trans women are in some way dangerous to children and cis women um, and can't be allowed to use the proper bathrooms. Um, and then they put a lot of funding behind it. They they funded front groups that purported to be feminist um, and that were arguing that you could throw out trans rights on the grounds of protecting women and girls. Um, and these are all essentially right wing culture jamming projects. Um, and they, they didn't even hide it. Um, but they were really trying to take that history that you've named, um, and use it as a weapon against all of us to say, when we're all united, we win and they know it. Then they know that when we are working together, we win victories like this for our whole united community. And they felt that this would be a place that they could divide us that they could put a wedge in and separate out cis LGBTQ people from trans people, including trans LGBTQ people. Um, And a lot of us expected that this Supreme Court decision might be one that would uplift the rights of cis people only in the LGBTQI community, um, and that would leave trans people out, and that it would be further part of that project of dividing us. And so to see us all advance together is, is so heartening. Um, There have been so many very well-funded efforts, you know, whether it's media campaigns or it's, um, you know, they've created curricula for for distributing in schools. 
um, you know, the massive, massive uh, campaign of transphobia we see in uh, British media right now um, has funding from American right-wing, anti-gay, anti-bi, anti-lesbian groups. Um, and we're finally seeing their, their strategy start to fail. Um, and it's, it's hugely heartening um, as a trans person, as a lesbian, you know, I'm so used to seeing our communities divided. And, um, and this time we won together and we showed that we can win together and that we can keep winning together. Um, and to have it happen at a moment of historic uprising around fighting for racial justice in this country and around fighting for immigrant justice in this community, to see those victories starting to come together, um, not just simultaneously, but in a coordinated way. Um, as a longtime community organizer, it's, it's, um, it's deeply inspiring. So as I understand it, the Supreme Court Chief Justice is the one who assigns the justice who will write the decision. Is that correct? And the fact is you know, that, he's, he, that he assigned this to Neil Gorsuch um, is both interesting and delicious. <laughs> but I'm kind of wondering if, what do we know about Neil Gorsuch? Does this portend you know, possible future approaches, either from lawyers and in, in arguing things to cases, knowing how he approaches things, or even just how, how do you think he's, he will uh, receive some of the other types of, of you know, very hot button legislation, yeah, uh, excuse me, cases that are on the Supreme Court? Uh, you're all smiling. So. <laughs> Imani, what do you think? Oh. Well, I do want to um, let, I'm not an attorney, so I, I do want to let the attorneys ask, but I mean, I, I think this was, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to decide. It, it is, it is hard to, to know because this was a shock to all of us. And so I'm not sure what this means because we also see in other decisions that he is very much, um, you know, been in favor of everything that we thought that he would be. So yeah. um, this you know, as you know, as it's been explained, how we've we've read about it, you know, that this is very textualist. That these are applying to um, specifically the words on the page, and I do think that that is something that's really strong. That we are looking at an interpretation of the way that something was written, not, you know, potentially um, uh, every bias that someone had at the time at the time that that these words were written. And I think that that's really important that we're that we're talking about because this isn't an argument that we haven't, um, this isn't an argument that's, that's new to us. It's not novel at all. You know, this was very much present in our, uh, in the, the marriage, marriage equality, um, and an argument that we've seen for all LGBTQ people, you know, like, um, in the nineties even. So this isn't something that's new. And because you literally cannot talk about sexual orientation or gender identity without talking about, um, gender or sex, then that's something that's going to matter. And that's something that they did pull out that, you know, that this is something that um, that that you you can't if someone doesn't understand what transgender or what homosexual means that you can't explain it to them without this and that was an important part of the decision so you know I don't know what this says about um, you know our more conservative justices for the future but I do know that in this time I think that they really did get it right and I know that that had to be I know that that had to be difficult so in this time I'm very proud of the you know integrity that the justice showed you know. Um, very specifically for, for this decision. Does someone else want to weigh in? Yeah, I think it's useful to place the decision in the, in the context of the history of how the court has been looking at Title VII. So Title VII prohibits discrimination on the basis of an individual's race, color, religion, sex, or, natural or, or national origin. And the story of how sex got included in Title VII is a little bit apocryphal at this point, but um, there's a... a woman named Polly Murray, who was a, a black gender nonconforming civil rights advocate who was circulating a memorandum at the time when Title VII was being considered in Congress, who argued in favor of adding sex. And that memorandum essentially was known to be well distributed amongst both the legislative and executive branch. So I wanna name Polly Murray as a person who had a lot to do with this, but the, the more well-known story is that there was a, a representative from uh, Virginia, uh, a Dixiecrat, um, Howard Smith, who added, who was the one who introduced sex to Title VII, and, and he did that as a, as a way to try and sink the passage of Title VII. He thought it would be a, a poison pill that <laughs> enough people who were, cons who were convinced that we needed an anti-discrimination law on the basis of race would be horrified at the idea of including women in that same statute and so that the, the statute would fail. 
So that's interesting in the context of textualism, because what you see in this Supreme Court opinion is a debate between three different conservative textual justices about what, how you look at the text of a statute. And you've got Justice Alito in his dissent, who's talking about what the text of the statute meant at the time that it was passed. And he has a, a lovely passage in there that uh, says, you know, it's sort of regrettable that we have to think about how people at the time thought about gay people, but the truth is that people thought of them as um, psychopaths and criminals. And so he's saying that history means that we can't in include uh, sexual orientation and, and gender identity in Title VII now because that isn't what the legislators at the time were thinking. And what Justice Gorsuch does, and, and I'm you know, hesitant to give him too much credit because he's making a, a, an overly simplistic uh, argument here, but we'll, we'll take the result. So let's just go with it in terms of comparing, uh, is that we need to look at the ordinary uh, meaning of the text as it is now, and it matters less what, uh, what the legislators were thinking at the time. So I can put that in context of some previous Supreme Court decisions on this matter. So uh, in 1989, there was a, a decision called Price Waterhouse, which was the first time that Title VII was interpreted to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex stereotyping. Essentially, there was a, a, a woman at Price Waterhouse who was sort of more viewed as more masculine presenting, and she faced discrimination on the basis of that, and she refused to make, wear makeup or dresses. And the Supreme Court said, that is discrimination on the basis of sex. And so once we've got that into place, when courts were considering the question of sexual orientation, it was, uh, we, we ended up with some absurd results where, uh, you know, uh, a lesbian who was more masculine presenting could bring a claim only if she made clear that she wasn't basing it on, that she didn't think she was discriminated because she was a lesbian, but because she was masculine presenting. Because the masculine presenting part was covered by the Price Waterhouse decision, but the sexual orientation part wasn't. And so just to Elena's point, I, I want to uh, say that Title VII really was consistently applied to protect trans people by judges before the Supreme Court got this case. It's it's me as a, as a gay man, you know, we were the add-ons here because courts didn't know what to do with sexual orientation. And when it came to the question of gender identity, it's harder to deny that that has something to do with sex discrimination, which is what Title VII prohibits. And so when we got to the, the oral arguments and there was really, and in the context of the Trump administration where trans people are really in the consistent crosshairs of, of uh, really disgusting efforts to, to discriminate against trans people, you know, this decision sweeping gender identity and sexual orientation into the plain meaning, as Justice Gorsuch says, of Title VII has pretty uh, wide reaching implications that um, we can talk about later. Right. This protects all of us. If you're considering, um, you know, if you're considering a same sex relationship to be inappropriate behavior for uh, a person of a given sex, if you're saying that your expectations for how a man should behave include being with women only, um, right, that, that is it is sex discrimination and it is discrimination on the basis to some degree on gender expression. Um, of what, what you feel is appropriate behavior for a man or a woman, whether it's how they dress or who they love or whatever. And part of this ruling is essentially, it doesn't matter whether you actually think trans people are the sex and gender they say they are, um, because you're still discriminating on the basis of sex when you discriminate against them. And it doesn't actually matter whether or not you respect who they are, it's still illegal, um, which protects the whole community. And it's amazing to me, as you were just saying, how much of this is sort of conservative plans gone awry <laughs> um, how much of this was based in their certainty that Gorsuch was, you know, strongly aligned with the Trump administration, strongly aligned with the Federalist Society. Um, I think there was an assumption that he was sort of in the bag for the other side of this argument. Um, and, you know, when this case was first going forward, when Amy Stevens was first pursuing this case, the understanding was that it would be going before a very different Supreme Court um, and a very different, um, you know, a Democratic uh, administration and her case was originally supported by the Department of Justice, which then switched sides when the administration switched and turned on her. Um, and unfortunately, right, she she died before learning um, that it had not been a disaster. Right, she bravely persevered pursuing this case, even once it became uh, much in doubt as to how it would go. 
Um, and I can't imagine the heartbreak of thinking that you were gonna pursue this case that was going to help protect your community. And then to see it look like maybe it would be a terrible blow to civil rights instead. And uh, I just hope that on, on some level she can be aware that in fact uh, her efforts did bear fruit and, uh, and make things better for all of us. Very important, yeah. I mean, not so much Gorsuch, but this is the Roberts Court. Mm -hmm. And so he's the Chief Justice, and lots of speculation. Is he the new, you know, Warren Court, you know, a, a Republican appointed justice that then kind of very flipped to more so to the left? And we've seen even RBG be more moderate and slowly as she builds legitimacy or whatnot, starting to be more left and, and very staunchly part of the that that left block there of women. Um, and you know, the court's legitimacy and the legitimacy of all branches of our government are in, in huge question right now. And so, you know, those of us in, that want to think like, hey, we have this check in terms of this independent judiciary uh, on the other branches of government, and they're supposed to uphold the rights of the min of minorities over the majority, um, and to have this happen in this political climate right now while people are still dying in the streets and at the hands of, you know, state-sponsored terrorism, you know, what would have happened if it would have gone the other way, but bringing it back more towards Chief Justice Roberts and all the speculation about where he's going to take his court. Traditionally, he's done like a one-two punch. He'll give us something here and take away something there. And we would be remiss if we do not talk about the Trojan horse of the decision. And that is that they're not opining on the extent and the scope of the religious exemption. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That was something that uh, definitely was thinking about when I was uh, embracing this decision. If you're just joining us or you've been joining us, please send us your questions and get engaged in the conversation. John will ask them. Um, now's a good time to check in if we've got... If Wait, that hadn't any. been okay, great. Ago, so. Yeah, no, this, is, this has all been um, very informational and, and educational and then celebratory at the same time. And I think for many of us, I mean... We, we understand what the decision, the basic decision, but maybe we haven't really uh, looked, you know, in, in depth of what this really means. And um, it, especially for those of you who have been fighting, you know, specific cases, uh, it's also hard if you weren't one of those folks or you weren't fired for being LGBTQ, like, um, you know, what What does this mean now? So before, when you're fighting the cases, we lose them all the time if somebody were, was fired for being LGBTQ. And then now moving forward, and you've mentioned this already in the first half, but uh, this if you, if you are fired and you have and you know for sure it's uh, your LGBTQ, it's a uh, it's lawyer up time. And, and more than likely, yes, you're going to win your case. Um, let us know or tell us like what does what does this actually mean? going forward and we'll start with Felicia. Well, you know, there's many aspects to that. And so if access to justice is a problem, no matter what laws or court cases are out there on the books, period. And if you were in a state that did not have state protections because of the interpretations of Title VII that hadn't been kind of sanctioned and blessed by the Supreme Court as it did the, earlier this week, you could just be fired. And then it was, and the community is, you know, had to take care of that. You know, you go to a lawyer and you say, this happened to me. And there's so many times we listen to elders or even not, or present day people where they, t they talk about how they were fired for having a picture of their loved one on their desk and there was no legal recourse because they lived in a state that did not have protections. And so this means now that there can be lawsuits, assuming there's lawyers, assuming, you know, there's great nonprofits like we have, you know, represented here today to represent them and to pair them up with attorneys to get these cases out in, in front and center and get some protections and some recourse. But aside from that very practical aspect of this, you know, there's very, there's a lot of differences between federal and state courts and what, 
is required in terms of getting a jury to go your way and the types of judges you will get. And so the law in and it of itself is not written for us or by us, even on the existing laws on the books and the legal precedent. And so there's inherently racist and sexist legal standards that those of us practicing in this space come up against all the time. And we use various legal strategies to combat that and to tell the story and make the story compelling. And that's why the gay marriage decisions were so effective because they told that story. You have Justice Kennedy writing these very beautiful, you know, love stories and that reached people and that said, look, these people are human too. They're just like you. There is no difference. And so there's lots of things I could say about both the legal standards that exist now, access to justice, and what this means and for the state, people in the states that did not have protections where 50% of LGBT people reside, and you know whether the Equality Act needs to come in and, and, and clean up some things here and broaden and expand into things like prisons and education and public accommodations. Um, but I think I might be getting kind of all over the place. So I will shift on to anybody else who wants to talk about what this really means. You know, Felicia, I think you did a wonderful job <laughs> because I think that is something that's really important that we don't talk about enough. And that is that it's always going to be hard. This this is not everything for us. There's actually, there's still a lot more to be done. And it's always going to be hard when you're asking someone to obey a rule or a law um, without any sort of enforcement. And so that's going to be something that matters, that we are still going to have to litigate here. This is not, this is not an end-all be-all. People will still try to illegally um, uh, fire people because they're part of the LGBTQ community. And also just saying again, that when we're talking about folks with very little institutional power, that that's gonna be something that's incredibly challenging. And then when we remember looking at intersections of identity, when we're looking at LGBTQ people, people of color, people with lower income, uh, lower incomes, people are already at a disadvantage and negatively impacted. And so these are all things that we have to take in consideration because it's not that easy to just go and and you know like say oh well I have a lost lawsuit you know there are there are barriers in place there so um so this isn't everything and then also just just also remembering that these cases remember no one was ever arguing um if the person was part of the LGBTQ community it was no question that they that they were and this is why they were being fired um but the question was if they were being protected under um by title seven and so really teasing that out that that's what we're talking about this protection here and then I wanted to, to mention something about the importance of marriage equality and just making sure that the things that we're doing aren't done in vain because it makes very little sense if we are able to legally marry the loves of our life and then we can lose our job then for bringing the same person to an office holiday party or putting a wedding picture on your desk and that's something that can most certainly happen so um so remember that when you know this protection it won't stop firing uh, employees from I'm sorry employers from firing their employees um but now we do have the protection of the of the federal court which I think is going to be really really important um and then I mentioned earlier that NCLR is you know we have a case right now that is very much waiting on this and so um we have um uh, so Mary and her wife, Bev, who uh, have been discriminated against and they um, when they tried to move to an assisted living facility and the assisted li living facility said that because they're a married couple that 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 they couldn't live there. And so we're actually waiting. We're waiting on this decision to figure out how we can move forward. Um, and so this is going to be something that's really helpful for us. But remember how long and how difficult it is to actually get to that point, because not everyone has that kind of access. So um, hopefully this will have more people people following suit, but remember that this isn't, this isn't everything, you know? I think, Michelle, in response to your question and, and to what um, both Imani and Felicia said, that it's useful to think about this Supreme Court case in terms of the people who are involved in it. So Donald Zarda is one of the plaintiffs in this case. He brought his lawsuit in September of 2010 and got the decision in June 2020. And Amy Stevens brought her lawsuit in uh, August of, uh, or she was fired in August of 2013 and just got this decision. Both of them passed away long before they were able to even find out that the law covered them, which is to say that neither of them have won their lawsuit, right? It's, it's important to remember that all this means is now these cases get sent back to the district court 
and essentially we're at the beginning of the lawsuit again, now with the understanding that Title VII does cover the discrimination that's at issue in the case. So their estates, the lawyers who are representing them are still gonna have to overcome all of the difficult burdens of proving that it was in fact this kind of discrimination that caused the, them to be fired. And so not only are they not uh, unfortunately around to see the results of, of the, the major change in the federal law that they're bringing, but their families aren't gonna know whether they're gonna benefit from these decisions for probably another year or two. And so the, and the last person involved, Gerald Bostick, is, is the plaintiff who is still with us, and he brought his lawsuit in May of 2016. And so it is difficult when you're thinking about how the law moves that, you know, the people that Felicia and I represent in terms of trying to bring justice for discrimination that they face in the, in the workplace, you know, they're, they're having to make difficult decisions about whether it makes sense to follow a lawsuit for more than 10 years when you may not be around to see the, the result of that. And so I think in terms of, you know, the distinction between justice in a, in a courtroom and justice in a broader societal sense, it's, it's a really difficult question about whether any of the actual people involved in these cases are going to benefit from the, the justice that they've managed to uh, bring in the world. Right. There's just there's so much further to go, especially because in a situation of at will employment, um, mm -hmm. you know, these cases, um, as you were saying, um, you know, they were pretty cut and dried. They were fired for their orientation or for their gender. Um, but there are plenty of cases where an employer uh, is firing someone because they don't like that they're gay or doesn't like that they're trans or doesn't like that they're bi. But that's not what they're saying. The reason for firing is they can say you didn't fit well in the culture of this workplace, or you didn't pick up the skills fast enough, or we're downsizing. And it's very hard to prove that discrimination is the reason for the firing. Um, there are so many issues that are going to need to be taken further and so much culture change that's going to need to be done to back up these legal decisions. But what this does do is give us more tools and more options while we fight those battles. Mm. I uh, grew up in the state of Wisconsin, which in 1982 was the first state to pass anti-discrimination uh, in the workplace laws, I believe just covering uh, gay men and lesbians. Um, my question really is, and we, we, we've talked a couple times here about what is it, the 28 states that don't have any laws. Is this likely to, I mean, those states that do have some laws, I assume there will be those that, for example, now this covers more than what they had in their original laws, but do you see those people, you know, both plaintiffs and, 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 and uh, justices and legislators in those states that already had some sort of laws, um, is there going to be as much impact there as there is in those other 28 states? I'm not sure if I'm asking there well, but um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I, I do think that, you know, the, the, this decision has the most impact in places where there weren't existing pr protections. Sure. So, for example, you know, when you're uh, when you're a plaintiff in a lawsuit, when you're somebody that that Felicia or I represent, we have to make a decision at the beginning of the case about whether to bring it in state court or federal court. And in recent years, with the uh, change in the judici judiciary that Mitch McConnell and, and President Trump have managed to uh, bring into existence and, and with the targeting of trans and LGBT people in federal law, you know, we've almost withdrawn entirely from the federal court system in terms of bringing our cases because in California, the protections are so much better under state law that we can bring cases in state court and have a better chance of getting a good result for our clients. You know, if you're in Oklahoma or Tennessee or Arkansas, you didn't have any of that. There wasn't a choice between state or federal court because the state courts didn't protect you and the federal courts didn't protect you either. Mm -hmm. And so this decision really is, you know, it will have hopefully far reaching benefits for the entire LGBT community with respect to other laws um, that hopefully we can talk about later. But for employment discrimination in particular, People who were in states that didn't have existing protections had no options before, and now they can go into federal court and say, yes, I was fired because of my sexual orientation. Yes, I was fired because I'm a transgender person. And that federal court, doesn't matter whether you're a judge appointed by President Trump or not, has to allow me to bring my case because the Supreme Court said so. And so that's the, the real power here is for the members of our community in, in red states, you know. It's, it's easy to sometimes forget for those of us who live in places where we have protections and where 
the discrimination exists, but can be a little bit more subtle, that there are many, many members of our community in states that just had literally on Friday of last week, zero production in the workplace, could be fired simply because they were gay or a member of the transgender community. And that's no longer true. And that's really powerful in terms of, you know, for people who are making the decision about whether it's safe to come out, for whether it's safe for them to be more fully realized members of themselves versus policing, you know, their gestures in the workplace or whether they are speaking in a way that might reveal to their employer that they're gay and then be subject to totally arbitrary firing or other adverse employment discriminations. They have brand new and really powerful protections. And that and you know, we're certainly grateful that the Supreme Court recognized that that was a necessary change to make. So let's say you are in the state of Wisconsin and there are state laws that protect you. You know, we have this this Supreme Court case right now and something we should really touch on that we keep dancing around is that Justice Gorsuch for the writing for the majority, you know, said we are not gonna opine on any kind of religious exemption. And so there are cases pending now that are thought to carve that out. And one of them is Our Lady of Guadalupe School. And that's where that has to do with the something called the ministerial exemption where people who work for ministers who have views based in faith that uh, you, know, you can discriminate against LGBT people. And then there's also something called the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act that has been the product of a lot of discrimination. And that law is where Congress said that, you know, a religiously neutral law that burdens a religion just as much as one that was intended to interfere with religion, that the government shall not substantially burden that person's exercise of religion, even if that burden results from a neutral rule. And so we have to be prepared and prepare our communities for this as well. And if you do work for a religious you know, institution in Wisconsin or California, um, because federal law preempts state law to some extent on, on constitutional issues, um, there is, there's going to be some tension and there's still some things on the horizon that we need to address and we need to make clear about um, and also you know, public accommodations and things like that have to be kind of hopefully put you know, robustly into legislation that doesn't allow for this major loophole to mm. blow up. And you. you know, like I, I wanna say, right, as, as a minister, right, I'm putting on my minister hat for a moment, the, the religious freedom framing around this is so disingenuous. Right, the, there there are so many religious organizations and denominations um, in in this country. Um, the majority of which are affirming, um, the majority of which don't want to discriminate, and who uh, have their religious freedom curtailed by having to exist mm-hmm. um, under laws that discriminate against queer and trans and LGBT people. Um, you know, for, for years, right, all, all of the various religious groups that were perfectly happy to marry two people of the same gender together um, and held that as sacred in their tradition weren't able to do it under the law. Their religion was not equal under the law because our law has favored religion as defined by right-wing conservative particular subset of Christian groups. Um, and so, Uh, The religious freedom framing is so much about giving one set of religious groups the freedom to determine the law and to discriminate against others when it is in fact curtailing the religious freedom of all of these other organizations who are supportive and affirming and on the side of justice in this. And um, it's just, it's a, it's such a hijacking of, of what religion can mean in this country um, and in this culture to, to define religion as discriminatory um, it's, uh, those loopholes are, are shameful and it's going to be a hard fight. Um, it's going to be a hard fight to close them. And of course we want people to be free to practice their religion in whatever way is right for them, but that doesn't give them the right to, to determine laws that harm other people. And, uh, when we look at it from a more pluralistic lens, um, we see that these religious freedoms are, are exactly the opposite. Yep. Yeah. And thank you so much for clarifying that, because even for myself, I almost almost missed that. I almost thought that this decision was all encompassing or inclusive of, uh, 
you know, even religious organizations. And, and so of course that, you know, set leads us to, there's so much more work that we've got to do. We got to keep this momentum up. Um, and speaking of momentum and just today, I, I want to, I don't want to miss the opportunity by talking about today's important, you know, decision involving DACA. Deferred action for childhood uh, arrivals, and uh, the fact that the the opinion is that the the president cannot terminate this program um, with just a a, t a tweet. No, um, <laughs> but he can't terminate this program that would impact seven hundred thousand plus um, uh, un undocumented folks that impact majorly impact even our community, LGBTQ community. So, would love for you to you know. Uh, share your thoughts, your perspective on this. And then is this the momentum? Are we, what, what you know, kind of what you think is happening, especially in the beginning of the program, you men mentioned, uh, you touched on some of the conservative voices. It was this a surprise as well, or uh, what do we do to, to keep the momentum going? That's, that was a whole lot because we were about tw 10, 12 to 13 minutes before a program ends. Um, we'll start with Imani. Uh, yeah, um, that I'm. I'm so glad we're getting to talk about what's next, and I'm also so glad that we spent so much time with religion because that is what's going to be next. This decision, very specifically, they said this decision did not include uh, religion. That is not what was put in front of them, and that was not a decision. And so I think that's really important. And that said, today was a good week for the Supreme Court. Um, you know these decisions are supposed to protect us, you know, and that's what we got to see. And so it's been, it's been a wonderful week, you know, um, we also need to look at other legislation. Like we need to pass the dream act. Like we need to look at, at legislation about what's going to, to, to support our country. Um, you know, this country is made up of folks that make, um, that make where we live better and safer, and we need to find ways to protect folks. But also I wanna say that we need to be looking at everything because you know when we're talking about LGBTQ issues, that every single issue is an LGBTQ issue. And we have to, we have to make sure that our voice is there inside of everything. And so when we're talking about, you know, um, this decision today very much impacts LGBTQ people. You know, we're waiting to hear to see if abortion care is gonna be gutted in Louisiana and um, June Medical versus uh, Russo. That is very much an LGBTQ issue. LGBTQ people should be part of the reproductive justice conversation, and often we're, we're left out of that. And that's something that we need to look at too. We have to remember that all of these issues are interconnected. And so this means something to all of us. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to, uh, to you and then to uh, all these amazing panelists. Thanks so much. No, wait, you're not going anywhere yet. <laughs> <laughs> you said we had I, remember, time, and I was like, oh, well, maybe I should say bye too. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I okay, definitely want to hear from well, everybody's you. thoughts. Are. So, uh, Felicia. Sure, yeah. So it was a fractured ruling, and Roberts, the Chief Justice we spoke about earlier, joined the majority. And the justices held that the High Court can review the DACA program, which offers deportation relief and work permits to young mi migrant children brought to the U.S. as children. Uh, they also found that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's decision to terminate the program was arbitrary and capricious. And this has been a trend of the Trump administration to skip over the appellate courts and run to the, you know, with white flight and just had, you know, privilege to that Supreme Court thinking that they're going to save him. And they you stomped down on that today. And that is a very important decision. And it is very important because of the intersectionality uh, that Imani points out and that migrant children and children and people are, are innocent. They are of all races and ethnicities and sexual orientations and gender identities. And they are contributing members to this society. And we stand in solidarity because we are them with all the DACA recipients. And I'm thrilled to have heard woken up to this this decision this morning. Kevin? Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a pretty narrow decision. So it, it's both 5-4, and, and, and I haven't read it yet. So I, any lawyer who's read it closely and uh, gets upset with anything I follow, I'm just reporting on, on what the broad strokes of it that I know, but that essentially the Supreme Court and Justice uh, Roberts particularly are reacting to the incompetence of the Trump administration. And, you know, you don't ever like to be in a place where the incompetence of the administration is what's protecting you. But this is the second time that Justice Roberts has gotten so fed up with 
the extent to which the Trump administration is willing to trample on existing law. So it reflects very much the census decision on, on the question of whether citizenship question could be added to the census. That was also a 5-4 decision where, just as uh, Robert said, you know, the Trump administration had no procedure for this. It was a clear attempt to change policy without going through what the Administrative Procedure Act requires. And unfortunately, the predicate for both of those decisions is that the administration had the power to do the things that it was trying to do if only had done it right. And so if the Trump administration had slightly better lawyers or had slightly more clever people working for it, then we might be having a different conversation. And the reason that's relevant to the to the uh, Title VII decision that we're discussing too is because they have gotten a little bit better at this rulemaking in terms of trying to justify the otherwise unjustifiable decisions that they're making. But with respect to the HHS decision uh, about trying to strip uh, more protections from trans people in the healthcare arena, the Trump HHS has a justification that anticipates the uh, the Title VII decision and tries to say that, uh, and this is, a, this is a quote actually, that the, uh, the binary biological character of sex, which is ultimately grounded in genetics, takes on special importance in the health context. Now, I don't know what that means because I don't think it means anything, but essentially it's the Trump administration trying to anticipate the decision in Bostock and saying, well, even if the Supreme Court says that because of sex means includes transgender people for Title VII, we should be able to make this discriminatory rule in the context of health, in the context of health providers and whether they uh, are required to treat trans people the same way that they treat uh, everyone else. And so, uh, you know, while I'm thrilled with the result and, and, and so, you know, heartened that we won't have to see the awful image and just the, the life altering uh, effects of deportations of, of 700,000 people who have been in this country who call this country home. Uh, you know, the the pessimist in me does say that it's a really narrow decision, and that with a with a slightly better villain in the story rather than Trump, we might be having a different conversation. And uh, Elena, Elena. I, I just really want to uplift um, what you have all have said already about how much this moment um, illuminates how integrated our issues are, right? That police violence is an LGBTQ issue. Racism is an LGBTQ issue. Uh, how we treat immigrants in this country is an LGBTQ issue. Healthcare is an LGBTQ issue. I have a permanent disability because um, doctors in an emergency room didn't want to touch me as a trans person. Um, and it meant that I will walk with a cane for the rest of my life. Uh, and that was in a country with, that was in, in California, right, with protections um, for healthcare that are now even further challenged. We have all of these fights to go, but we are seeing how connected these fights are to each other and how many of the same people are coming for us. These religious exemptions that we're going to be having to fight when it comes to employment discrimination or healthcare discrimination weren't originally applied to discrimination against trans people or to um, marriage inequality. They were originally in support of segregation, right? The same people who are arguing now that they should not have to treat LGBTQ people equally literally in many cases are the same people who put these structures in place so that they would not have to treat people uh, with equality and justice racially. And it is, it is just a transformation of the same fight and another facet of the same fight. And it's, it's just such a reminder that these, these struggles are linked. You know, the, the church that ordained me right in San Francisco was founded in the 40s specifically as an anti-segregation civil rights experiment because at that time religious freedom was being used as the cudgel to support segregation. Um, and we're, we're seeing it used again to support white supremacy in this country. Um, and, you know, whether we're fighting on the realm of healthcare or employment rights, which is intimately linked to healthcare, because of course, until we have universal health care in this country, whether or not you can get medicine is linked to whether or not you are uh, employed in a legitimate economy. Um, this, is, this is a huge victory, and it is one that hopefully will strengthen us for all of the fights ahead. And um, if anything is to be learned from this moment and from this administration that is coming for the civil rights of all of us, it is that we need to be together in that fight. Mm. Okay, so two big case decisions this week. What are some uh, 
coming up cases and rulings that you're particularly looking forward to, whether they're ones you're hopeful about or fearful about because they're, they're so important. Uh, I'd love to hear from all of you. Maybe start with you, Felicia. Yeah, I mean, I'm just so overwhelmed and I, you know, the religious exemption cases and the ministerial exemption cases is something that we all need to be watching very closely. Um, you know, there's the Supreme Court hears things that impact our lives, um, even whether you hear about it or not, uh, you know, on a on a set term and the court and the legitimacy of the court and the impartiality, supposed impartiality of the court is what we really need to be talking about here. You know, there's thousands of decisions that we could be looking at and the legal framework within settled law to begin with. But if we... Um, do not win this election, if there's any kind of court packing that goes on, if the sanctity of that court, which is somehow sometimes seen as the ultimate sovereign in this country, um, is it shifts even more, you know, that there, there is, you know, a, a huge, huge, even bigger problem here. Kevin? Uh we have, um, uh, so one of the small graces of the Gorsuch opinion that I think is worth uh, highlighting is that there's no dispute, there's no uh, back and forth about whether the plaintiff, Amy Stevens, should be referred to the with the pronouns that she prefers. And unfortunately, that wasn't settled practice in the federal courts in the United States, even before this opinion. And then, so for example, we have a, a circuit split, which means two uh, federal courts of appeals ruled differently on the question of whether under the United States Constitution, incarcerated people who are transgender are entitled to uh, the same medical treatment. So there's a Fifth Circuit opinion where uh, not only did they decline to find that medical treatment was required by the Constitution, but intentionally and, and really cruelly refused to use the proper pronouns to refer to the plaintiff. And that opinion, the Supreme Court declines to take. So that is existing good law in the Fifth Circuit, which includes principally Texas. Fortunately, and, and we were all terrified when we got when the Supreme Court turned down that case that that was going to become law across the country. Fortunately, there's a, a Ninth Circuit case out of Idaho where the Ninth Circuit found that the uh, incarcerated person who was transgender is entitled to medical care. And the Supreme Court also declined to take that case. So we have two different laws in two different areas of the country with respect to that question. And we have two different approaches from the federal judiciary, one which takes the basic humanity of the plaintiff as a given and, choose, and decides to use the proper pronouns and, and give the person the name that they've chosen, and one that's really cruel on purpose. And unfortunately, those two cases are both good law. So the Supreme Court could take that up in the future, and, and hopefully we'll, we can extrapolate from this decision that Justice Gorsuch and, and at least a Justice Roberts, and so along with the liberal justices, that's a total of six justices, are you know rejecting this intentional cruelty and, and will treat people with the dignity that they deserve in future cases. Thanks. Um, um, Imani? Or, you know, and I just uh, mentioned a case, but I, you know, I think um, in closing, I just want to make sure that we don't, um, uh, that we don't ignore what's also happening right here, that there's a lot of ways that we can see structural change and that we are actually seeing people right now in the streets um, that are literally responsible for the structural change related to um, policing. And we're seeing what that can do um, and remembering that we've never gotten anywhere without people in the street. So the things that start in the streets are often the things that end up in the courtroom. So so um, just in closing, I do want to say that this is how we get here. And so um, this is something to be paying attention to. And I will say that that is what I am most interested in right now. Elena. And I know we only have a moment. So I want to say hell yes to that. Um, <laughs> and also just that this is just such a reminder that we cannot be divided from each other, that there will continue to be massive cultural and media efforts to turn our civil rights struggles against each other, to try and pit Asians against black people or Jews against Muslims or cis gay people against trans people, that, that there is a real recognition that whenever we display that we're willing to leave one group of us behind or treat one group of us as expendable, that that will be used as a vulnerability to attack, to attack all of our civil rights struggles. 
uh, and that the more we refuse to abandon each other, the more we stand in solidarity with each other and show up for each other's struggles, whether or not they're our own, the more we are in a power position, a position of great strength to, to push for progress um, all across the board. And we don't know how the election is going to go. We don't know what kind of fight is ahead of us. But there are a lot of people who are used to long odds and unfair fights and have been in this for decades. And when we can follow their leadership and follow their lead, um, they are the ones who, who know how to survive it when it's hard. And we will get to a better world so long as we're not divided from each other. Let's keep fighting, Lynn, and fight together. I love this. I love this program. And thank you so much to our incredible panelists. Thank you for being here and thank you for doing the work and, and protecting all of us. Um, please support the work of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, Trans Lifeline, and, and Medina Orthwine LLP. Thank you to all of you for joining us here at the Commonwealth Club. We have some incredible programming coming up next week for Pride Week, uh, one with San Francisco Pride, our last of the Lavender series, in which we'll recognize some Pride awardees, and then also a special program with Rick Welts, the COO of the Warriors, and uh, Chief 49ers admin Hannah, uh, Hannah Gordon, that's right, who will be with us to talk about resiliency in the sports league. So join us by reserving your spot at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. We'll see you next time. <laughs>